Hello, everybody. Coach Kurt. Welcome to ACD Combatives. First, let me say, if you are watching this video and your idea is that all cops are bad and evil and we should defund the police, then this isn't the video for you. If you believe like me that 90 to 95 percent of cops are good and want to do the right thing and just try to do the right thing, then this is the video for you. So let's talk about de-escalation for cops fighting skills and the magic pill well there is no magic pill per se but you guys know this is a control tactics use a force channel and uh, combatives and uh, so you know where i'm probably coming from on this but hear me out please de-escalation is the magic catchphrase of the day and i for the record 100 percent embrace the idea of teaching cops good de-escalation skills not just dealing with a upset angry irate individual but somebody with mental health skills they need extensive training in that area and cops aren't getting enough of that uh dealing with somebody uh on drugs and alcohol uh you know we get a lot of experience in the field doing that but it training is you know catch or miss when it comes to that kind of stuff when it comes to control tactics use of force taser pepper spray baton firearms we don't even get enough of that stuff. That being said, cops do generally get more firearms training than any of the use of force and control tactics combatives training, which is sad considering uh, you should be able to go, uh, hopefully, your entire career without using your firearm. Obviously, you can, and cops do. It's just the facts of life. But you are absolutely going to go hands-on much, much more, if not weekly sometimes, depending on your jurisdiction, or even daily, depending on your jurisdiction, um, with uh, suspects. So here's where I'm going with this. De-escalation is great and the training is super important, but the important thing to know about de-escalation is if you are scared and have no com uh, confidence in your skills to defend yourself and actually physically arrest somebody that who is actively trying to resist you, maybe escape or maybe fight you, or maybe even try to kill you, take your gun, or what have you. If you don't have the confidence in those, those skills, I guarantee you the predator that you are dealing with, the average bad guy who is a real bad guy, can smell fear. We all know that the predator can smell fear. And if you don't have confidence in yourself and your skills, it will show. And when your taser fails, and it will. When your pepper spray fails, and it will. And when your baton fails, and it will. And you don't know what else to do because you have no hands-on control tactics training. Yes, your department might give you 40 hours a year, best case scenario. There's the unicorn departments that do monthly or even weekly training. Those are unicorns. They're excessively rare. Uh, I can give you a case study on one out of Georgia if you're interested. But most departments have, like my department, for example, eight hours a year for control tactics. And that includes taser uh, pepper spray, uh, baton, and we throw some use of force concepts and ideas and case law updates into that. Uh, sometimes we'll do that on a separate day where we're doing uh, case law and legal updates, which is important. And then we'll do firearms the following day. So our quals are usually three days long, twice a year. Guys, it's grossly, it's just not enough. And when I bring it up to certain command staff, that we need to train more, and in their defense, they aren't the people that, that are in charge of that, believe it or not, they're middle management. They're like, well, you and the some of the other instructors train that stuff, you know, weekly. You can't expect the officers to be able to pick that stuff up in the amount of time we have. So they are aware of the problem. They know that it's an issue. Uh, where am I going with all this? Again, if you are afraid to, to scuffle, if you can't take a grown, active, athletic a person down to the ground, first of all, they're going to maybe attack you or you're going to grab them and they're going to try to pull away. You have to be able to be sucked in, get into the clinch position, feel comfortable in that clinch because it's close, it's uncomfortable. If you're not used to being right up on somebody's shiznit and if you don't train some kind of contact martial art, you're not going to be comfortable in the clinch range and those arts would be muay thai brazilian jiu-jitsu judo sambo uh regular jiu-jitsu as in japanese jiu-jitsu at certain 
decent Krav Maga schools can do a lot of clinch work, others not so much, and that goes for Japanese Jiu-Jitsu. It's hit or miss if you're going to get a good school or not. You get the idea. Of course, I teach and train Taiho Jitsu, so that's in the mix, but it's basically a variation of Japanese Jiu-Jitsu. Uh, you're going to get what you get at the kind of school you go to. So it's important to find a quality school that spends a lot of time in the clinch range, how to defend the takedown, how to do the takedown. And if you're a police officer, you have to be able to have that good positional control and eventually go to a submission position, like an arm bar or what have you. We're not going to get into details on that. And then transform that position to handcuffing. If you're a cop anywhere in the world, let alone America, and you're not comfortable being able to do that, it will show on your face. So the fear is there, and when the shit hits the fan, or the poo-poo hits the oscillating device, as it were, you're not going to know what to do. So when your taser fails, your pepper spray fails, your baton fails, you end up going to your gun, because you have no other option at that point. And was it something that could have been avoided? Maybe. I don't know. It's scenario by scenario. It's easy to judge on CNN when you're watching it. Um, Guys, the use of force can be violent, it can be ugly, and it can be bad to look at. It's ugly to look at. Violence is bad to look at. Even a beautiful boxing match where two people are highly trained combatives, you know, they they have good fisticuff skills and they're really good boxers, and it's beautiful to watch. It's also very violent to watch. It, it good MMA match. It's violent to watch. It's bad. Is no matter how skilled these fighters are, the average American, and we know this from the Vietnam War, things changed when you could see people dying on TV on the national news at night when you were eating your dinner. People get soured by that kind of stuff, and they don't like to see it. So they come out with these ideas. Well, we need to teach cops how to deescalate, and I agree. We absolutely do. But the only way to do that. Well, one of the most important ways to do that, because I'm not saying cops shouldn't do other type of training, like how to talk to people with mental health issues and all that kind of stuff. That's way undertrained in law enforcement today, and that's an entire different video. But at when the rubber meets the road, if the average officer is not comfortable scrapping, getting you know punched in the face every once in a while, and then they're not going to be comfortable with the de-escalation and it's going to show on their face and they're not going to have the presence, the officer presence, the command presence, and they're going to lose control of the situation. And guys, sometimes that happens regardless if it's a good command presence officer, the person's on drugs, the person's mentally ill, and no matter everything they do, they do the right thing and it still gets ugly and they still have to use force. That's just the facts of life. That's the facts of law enforcement. So I hope I made my point <clears throat> to summarize de-escalation is great and dandy, Uh, It's not a magic pill just to say I went through some de-escalation training. The magic pill, in my opinion, generally speaking, it's not the cure for all issues, is a much, much higher, we're talking weekly training in a quality control tactics program. We're talking MMA-based, jiu-jitsu-based. So let's wrap this up. I'm pushing this narrative because I believe that it is... The only way to save law enforcement training as it is happening today. Slowly but surely, there are more departments that are coming on board and doing much more training. But I truly feel that if you're not training weekly, you're, you're letting yourself down. You're letting the community down that you serve. And uh, if you want to do better and be better, you should train weekly. Some kind of, like I said... Uh, jiu-jitsu based program i'm talking brazilian jiu-jitsu or japanese jiu-jitsu if it's a school that trains jiu-jitsu with a live program an effective rolling slash rondori program similar to judo or brazilian jiu-jitsu uh then terrific um i personally teach taiho jitsu and the reason i don't push that is i mean yes taiho jitsu is arresting art arresting techniques it is basically a subset of japanese jiu-jitsu specially designed for the police the problem is it's extremely hard to find uh it's just very rare and you know spattered throughout this the country uh, the United States uh, Jiu-Jitsu Federation has a Taiho, U.S. Taiho Jitsu program, and a four, there's probably a representative in 40 of the states so far as a, the making of this recording. So it is out there, but it's rare. And uh, depending on where you train it, it's like Japanese Jiu-Jitsu. It's basically a variation of Japanese Jiu-Jitsu. And if they don't do live active training like you would find in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or Judo or, or MMA-style grappling, then uh, it's probably not going to fit the bill. 
Anyway, everybody take care, like, subscribe, and share, and be careful out there. Let's roll. Hey, let's be careful out there.